Good afternoon and welcome to Pay Entries weekly webinar. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about how to classify and pay your employees correctly according to the Fair Labor Standards Act. Sounds fascinating, doesn't it? Um, I'll be your host today. I'm Kathy Graham, um, head of the HR Services Division of Pay Entry. I want to welcome you to this event. Uh, by no means am I an attorney, so the information that you're getting today is not legal advice, but it is going to help you get an idea of whether or not you're paying your people correctly. So let's just start into this. Um, what we're going to cover today is classifying and paying your um, employees correctly under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So who makes these rules that you have to follow? What is FLSA? Um, we're going to define exempt versus non-exempt, um, go over the two tests that there are for the um, classifications. We're going to talk about the exemption classes and the state variations because states can be different than federal. So who makes the rules? Well, the Department of Labor does for the federal level. And then you have state and local governments that implement um, pay uh, rules on top of that. So, but primarily what we're gonna talk about today is the US Department of Labor and their control over how we pay people that work for us. The Fair Labor Standards Act is the premier or the primary um, rule, rule uh, look of, I'm sorry, it's the primary rule for paying employees. Under the Fair Labor Stacks, uh, goodness gracious, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, there are minimum wage, overtime pay, record keeping, and youth employment standards. So this is where all of the rules for how you pay your people are kept. One of the things that I wanted to mention too is that you have two handouts today. One of the handouts is a PowerPoint uh, or a copy of this uh, PowerPoint. The next is a copy of the uh, fact sheet from the Department of Labor that goes through and defines each one of the categories of exemption that we're gonna talk about today. First of all, the Fair Labor Standards Act, as I mentioned, governs minimum wage. The federal minimum wage right now is $7.25 an hour, and that was effective back in 2009. So it has not been um, increased since that time frame. During the last act that was uh, proposed, the American Rescue Plan Act, um, there, there was a proposal for a $15 federal minimum wage, and that was withdrawn in order to get the that act to pass. So um, the minimum wage is still at, stuck at seven and a quarter. However, the states have minimum wage laws, and most states have higher rates for minimum wage. Um, California, if you have less than 25 people, it's $14.25. Um, if you have more than 25 people, it's $15 an hour. And as you'll see a lot of states with, with um, different minimum wages. The employee, if you're in a state that has a higher minimum wage than the federal, you have to pay the higher rate. Okay, let's talk about overtime because that's ruled by this same um, FLSA rule. Non-exempt employees must receive um, overtime for anything over 40 hours a week at a rate not less than one and a half times their hourly rate, which is or their regular rate of pay. We had a um, webinar recently, I think in the last couple of months on what is this regular rate of pay. Regular rate of pay includes any commissions and bonuses. Um, and if you'd like a copy of that webinar, uh, shoot me an email or go on our website and you can look under webinar recordings and that um, recording will be there for you to listen to. There's no requirement for overtime pay for work on the weekends, the holidays, or regular days uh, of rest, unless the number of hours exceed in the week exceeds 40. So just because you bring someone in on a holiday doesn't make, mean you have to pay them any sort of premium pay. Most, a lot of companies do, 
just from a competitive standpoint, but you're not required to unless that, that holiday pay would um, cause them to work over 40 hours in the week. And that is if they worked that day, not if they took it off. Because holiday pay, vacation, things of that nature, they don't count as hours worked if the person wasn't working. Let's talk about hours worked. Um, this includes all time um, when the employee is required to be on your premises, on duty, or at a prescribed workplace. Um, there, we're not going to go into what our hours work, but we probably will have a webinar about this because, you know, what, what if someone is traveling during the day? Um, there are lots of rules on um, hours worked and what is hours worked. So I believe in the next 60 days, we will have a, a webinar on this. And record keeping. Fair Labor Standards Act also requires that you display the poster that you're supposed to be displaying in your workforce. Um, that outline the requirements of that law. Um, and if you are um, an employer that has a lot of remote employees, um, you have to furnish the posters to the individual at their work site. We now have e-posters. We have not advertised this yet, but if you have um, a lot of remote workers or a couple of remote workers and you would like uh, to get to um, take advantage of our e-poster subscription, um, just shoot me an email and I'll send you the information on it. We probably will have a class on it. posters again pretty soon and we would also have the information there, but what it does is it sends them an electronic version and anytime there's a change, they get an update. So um, it keeps you um, on top of things. We just sent those out to all of our employees because we are all remote, which is a little strange, but um, it is working for us. In addition, um, employers um, have to keep employee time and pay records. And there is a chart for that. And um, I say I keep everything forever, um, especially if the person is still working. But there are some time frames, like six years, eight years for ERISA kind of documents. Um, and we will have a webinar upcoming on record keeping also. So stay tuned. And under the Fair Labor Standards Act, they deal with child uh, labor. There are provisions to protect the um, opportunities and prohibit their employment in certain jobs and under certain conditions that would be, would be detrimental um, to um, a child um, to keep them in school. So there's certain hours they can't work um, if they're a certain under a certain age, and if you need that information, um, you can go to the Department of Labor and get that, or you can just email me and I'll send it to you. One thing I want to remind you is that if you ever need, uh, you have a question um, and you're a pay entry client, don't feel like you have to um, go and look for it. All you have to do is let me know you have the question and I'll get it answered for you. Child labor also um, laws also restrict the number of hours that, that um, um, minors can work based on the type of work that's being performed. So during the summertime, we do get questions about, can I, can my son work for the company? He's 13. So if you have questions like that that come up, just let us know. All right, exempt versus non-exempt. This is why we're here today. This is the, one of the most misunderstood um, sets of rules in HR. Um, and between 70 to 90% of employers get it wrong. Some know that they're getting it wrong um, and choose not to look at it. I've talked to, to HR people or administration people, office managers that say, you know, my boss made this guy a, a welder. He made him salaried. Well, welders can't be salaried. It's very clear in the law that welders can't be salaried, but he made this person salaried. Um, and there's nothing she can do about it. So until that group or that company gets an audit, somebody complains about it and it, they're audited, you know, life goes on. But the minute an audit occurs, you know, it is not a pretty sight. They don't just look at what your, the mistakes you made today. Um, they go back years um, and they don't look at the one person that complained. They look at everybody. So it is not a, um, a fun 
um, type of event that you'd want to get involved in. So why it is, is it important to know the difference between exempt and non-exempt? And when we say exempt and non-exempt in, in everyday language, you're probably talking salaried and non um, or just hourly people, salaried and hourly. Well, it's important to know because non-exempt employees have to be paid overtime. And that's the big piece. That's, that's what the Department of Labor um, is after when they're looking at an audit. If you have people you've classified as salaried that aren't eligible for overtime, um, and somebody leaves your company and complains that they worked a lot of overtime and you never paid them for that, that you will get, you will be audited, and if they find that out, there are penalties. You um, would owe that person back pay, and they would look at everyone else in your company to see if they were classified correctly. So you want to make sure that you've got everybody classified correctly, um, or that at least you've attempted to. If someone is blocking you from from doing that, at least you made the effort to do that, so it doesn't fall back on your your head. Um, there are two tests for exempt status. How do you tell if someone is exempt? Well, number one, there is a wage parameter here. And after that, there are job responsibilities. And you can't do one without the other. They have to be considered together. So first of all, we look at the wages that the person is making and do those meet the threshold? And then what are their job responsibilities? And this is based on uh, job responsibilities um, uh, are um, driven and in, 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 during an audit, uh, the person would be looking at your job descriptions. So it's important to have current job descriptions. The first test that I mentioned was wages. This is the easiest of the two tests. And if we could just apply this one, it would be so much easier and life would be easier. But the laws establish a minimum pay threshold. Um, it's currently $684 a week and $35,568 annually. Now, this is the federal law, okay? I, want, I might mention that California, in California, um, you have to pay, if you have less than 20, well, if you have to pay twice as much to a salaried person, so the threshold is based on the minimum wage for um, California, which let's just say now it's $15 an hour, you have to be paying the person at least $60, um, I'm sorry, $30 an hour multiplied times 2,080 is over $60,000. So 80, 2,000, yes, over that. So anyway, it's twice as much um, It's it's um, as the, the minimum wage, but at the federal level, it's uh, 35,568 a week. So the first thing you have to do is determine what state you're in and which minimum pay threshold um, you're trying to um, comply with. And that's the first thing. If they don't meet the salary threshold, then they're not exempt. So that's the first thing, meeting that salary threshold, regardless of the um, state. This is the federal level. Um, and if you want to know your threshold for your state, just take your minimum wage and um, well, that's in California, it's times two, but um, we want to find out what your exempt threshold is in your state. And then the second test is the hard one. It's the duties test. If an employee meets the wage test, then their duties and responsibilities determine the status. So it's not based on just wages, it's both. The classes defined under the Fair Labor Standards Act are executive, administrative, learned professional, creative professional, computer professional, outside sales, and highly compensated employee. In one of the handouts that I've given you, these things are defined. And we're gonna go over each one of those um, uh, in just a second. Each class has its own specific set of rules. And in order for someone to be exempt, they have to fit into one of these. So let's look at the executive exemption. Um, to qualify as exempt from overtime, employees have to 
first of all, have a primary duty of managing an enterprise, which is a company or a department of the company. So it has to be a top level job as an executive. They have to supervise at least two full-time employees. They have to have the authority to hire, fire, or promote, or have their recommendation given weight in those decisions. So they would be a decision maker in the ability to fire someone or hire someone. And it can't be just one of these rules, it's all of them. So there should be an and between each one of these because if you can't have one without the, without the other two. And that would classify someone as an executive exemption. Now here's an example, and I'm gonna take a poll on this. You have a, a place where you can, um, there's a poll thing, thing, thingy on your computer. I don't know what it looks like on your end. I'll have to look into that. But what I wanna do is give you an example and let you tell me if they're exempt or non-exempt. Sally earns $54,000 a year. She's a customer service manager, and she has four customer service reps that report to her. She's currently interviewing to increase staff in the department. So let me launch this and you can vote on this. Is she exempt or non-exempt? Okay, all right, I'm gonna share the results here with you and you got it right. Everybody got this right. So that was an easy one though, okay? All right, so let's go on to the next one. Harry earns 43,000 as an assistant manager in a pet store. While he oversees and he sometimes coaches other employees, he spends most of his time working the register and stocking shelves with new inventory. Is he exempt or non-exempt? Let me just pull this up. Okay, you can vote on that one. All right, I think we're there. Um, let me just share your answers. You're right, you guys are smart, paying attention. The thing about the, this is where a lot of lawsuits come into play. There are so many lawsuits about assistant managers in retail stores. Um, because he is not over, he's not, let me back up. Because most of his time is spent doing the same kind of work that the people he is um, supervising do, then that makes him, um, you know, he does not have the responsibilities of managing as much as he does while he does do a lot of coaching and he's making sure the doors are locked and everything's um, kosher. Um, and he earns enough money to be exempt. He's not exempt because of his job responsibilities. They don't make the, uh, the test. Okay, well, let's talk about the next one. This, this one is what causes the nightmare. The administrative exemption. This is the most misunderstood and most misapplied exemption. Um, the primary duty must be performing office or non-manual work directly related to the management or general business operation of the employer. Now that seems really reasonable, right? So all your administrative assistants and, and these people that are doing administrative work, they would fall under this, but not so fast. In addition to that, their duties have to include the exercise of discretion and independent judgment with respect to matters of significance. And so that steps across the line that um, most administrative assistants, which is where we, we get this um, a lot of problems or the boss's secretary or someone like that, the matters of significance have to be in relationship to making decisions about the companies, the company or its policies um, in hiring and firing people, that kind of um, independent judgment. It's not what kind of sandwiches should I order for the board meeting next week um, or where should we hold the board meeting? Those are decisions that are made as an, at the administrative level but they don't um, 
rise to the administrative exemption because there, the key is matters of significance. And all of these rules must be made, met, I'm sorry, um, which is standard for all of these exemption tests. Okay, here's an example for you. Patty is an insurance claims analyst and she earns $70,000 a year. She has no direct reports. Her duties include interviewing clients and determining the type of coverage they should purchase, preparing estimates and making decisions about their eligibility for coverage. Do you think that this person is exempt or non-exempt? You guys are smart. Oops, going back the other way here. Okay, we're gonna close this and I'm gonna share with you. And she's exempt. So on this one, you went the other direction. She earns enough money, so there's the wage test. She interviews clients and she makes the determination of the type of coverage that they should purchase. So for that person and the company, she's giving them advice on what they should purchase. And that's a matter of significance. Preparing the estimates is not, but making decisions about someone's eligibility for coverage or what type of coverage they should purchase is something that could put the company at risk um, for a claim against them. And so this person could be considered exempt. Okay, how about this one? Harriet is the administrative assistant to the CEO. She earns $72,000 a year and she maintains the CEO's schedule. She coordinates meetings and she attends the board meetings to record the sessions. Is this person exempt or non-exempt? Okay, you are correct. This is a non-exempt employee, but how many of you know or throughout your career have had the administrative assistant to the CEO be salaried? It happens all the time because it elevates them to a level, everybody thinks that salaried has a prestige, being salaried has uh, a prestige or status that goes along with it. It just means you work a lot of extra hours and don't get paid for it. So um, it is um, not the status that, that they think it is, but, but they'd be better off if they got paid overtime. And that's what the Department of Labor thinks also. So you did really good on that one. Okay, let's talk about the learned professional exemption. The next two and three are, are easier. These, um, this employee's, um, an employee's area of expertise has to be related to a, a field of science or learning and has to come from a prolonged course of study. They primarily perform work that requires advanced knowledge or work that's intellectual in um, nature. And um, it's commonly applied to legal, accounting, medical, and teaching professionals. And Michael is a CPA, is an audit associate for a major accounting firm. As part of his job responsibilities, he provides tax and advisory services to client companies. Is Michael exempt or non-exempt? And remember, we're looking at the learned professional. Okay. Well, you got that one right. He is exempt because he is a learned professional. He's, he's, he's a CPA on top of uh, having a degree because that usually comes afterwards. He's working for a major accounting firm. So, yes, he is exempt. But what about... Gillian, 
After graduating from college with a major in education, she accepts a job as a teacher's aide at a local elementary school. Her primary responsibilities include helping teachers prepare for their lessons, printing classroom assignments, and record keeping. Is she exempt or non-exempt? Okay, let me share this with you. This person is non-exempt, so you got that one right, the majority of you. Because she's just a helper, um, she's not the teacher. Um, she did graduate from college, but she's not considered a learned professional because of her duties. The next one's also pretty easy. Um, there's a creative professional exemption, and that requires that um, the employee perform work um, that that where the person has to have inventive um, skills, imagination, originality, or talent in the arts or creative field. It commonly applies to graphic designers, artists, writers, and journalists. So those people pretty much um, um, stick out. If if you have one, you know that they're a creative professional. Like if you have a web designer or you have someone who's a um, marketing person, but all they do is graphic design and your website, things of that nature. Those people are considered to be um, exempt. So let's look at an example of that one. Kelly is a graphic designer at a small tech company, and her primary duties include planning and designing concepts for advertising and other marketing initiatives. As a sign, she also handles the design of sales and internal collateral. Do you think she is exempt or non-exempt? Okay, she is exempt. She All she does is graphic design um, and very creative types of things. So yes, she would be exempt. And now here's another one that gets um, a little bit tangled up once in a while, the computer professional exemption. Um, to meet this exemption, the employee must be employed as a computer systems analyst, a programmer, a software engineer, or a similarly skilled position. The primary duties have to include systems analysis, consulting with users, or design and development teams of computer systems or programs. Note, an employee that um, maintains your company's software and that helps the, the users um, troubleshoot problems um, on your phone system or your company software or any other, like a Windows uh, product. They normally are called help desk people. Those people are not exempt. They are hourly employees based on the law. So let's look at an example of this. Paulina is a systems engineer at a global aerospace and defense company. Her primary uh, responsibilities are the development of uh, testing, um, I'm sorry, development, testing, and management of missile guidance systems. Do you think that Paulina is um, exempt or non-exempt? Okay, let me share this with you. It looks like you guys are um, neck and neck there for a while, but then exempt pulled ahead, and this person is exempt. They are a systems engineer, which is one of the job titles, um, and they include the development, testing, and management of guidance systems. Pretty heavy job. Let's look at the next one. Um, Eugene is a, I'm sorry, I forgot to push the button. Um, Eugene is a help desk associate 
who only earns or who earns an annual salary of 65,000, works at the help desk. He installs and he troubleshoots company software, manages the phone system, and he helps to keep the business's data secure. And that is a typo I will fix. Um, let's see here. Tell me if you think this person is exempt or non-exempt. Okay, I'm going to share your answers. This person is non-exempt. This is an hourly person because they are not a systems engineer. They're not working on programming things. They are troubleshooters and installers. So this person would be hourly. And that's a big um, problem in a lot of companies is that these help desk people are not qualified, I mean, I'm sorry, are qual gosh, are, are um, categorized as salaried or exempt when they're really hourly employees. And there's also something called an outside sales ex exemption. On the things, the executive, administrative, and the professionals that we've just talked about, first of all, you have to meet that wage test. On the outside sales exemption, your salespeople, there is no wage test, so you don't have to pass that. Um, the employee primarily spends their working hours making sales or securing contracts, but they have to be regularly outside of the company's office as a part of their work. They cannot sit in the office and make calls and sell over the phone. They have to be out and about. Um, a sales employee working remotely from home does not qualify as outside sales because that office um, at home is, or any fixed site is, that's used by the salesperson as the headquarters is considered their place of business. So just remember for someone to be exempt um, let's say you have a salesperson who's on straight commission. That's fine because there's no wage test here. Um, and they are out and about, they're out uh, meeting people, signing contracts, doing that kind of thing. Maybe they come into the office a couple hours a week to get stuff done and maybe they don't. So those people would qualify as outside sales. This is pretty straightforward. And there's this, um, a classification called highly compensated employee. The employee has to earn at least $107,432 a year. So this is one of the reasons for calling it highly compensated and perform primarily office or non-manual work. They would regularly perform at least one duty that classifies under one of the other exemptions. For example, the executive or administrative. And this is often used if the highly compensated employee does not manage any employees. So remember, the executive has to supervise at least two individuals. So if they don't, then you could classify them under the highly compensated employee. One of the things that just drives us crazy is the, all the state laws and we have clients all over the United States. Um, the federal laws create a baseline and that's the minimum that amount that you can do. But if your state goes even further, further with the duties tests, um, which they can do, or you know the pay grade, I mean the pay rate, then you have to um, choose the higher level or you have to uh, comply with the higher level. Some examples of that is in California, to qualify for a learned professional exemption, an employee needs to hold a state recognized license or certification. So that's on top of the rules that are on the federal side. The computer professional exemption category has been altered. Um, and now that the minimum salary for an engineer or a programmer to even be considered for the exemption is $96,000, um, over $96,000 a year. And California doesn't recognize the highly compensated employee as a, a legitimate excuse for an exemption. These are all California rules. So you can see California is a crazy state and um, I'm surprised that any employer goes in there willingly um, because it is 
they have more laws than any other state in the United States um, for employees and, and employers. So just know that you've got to pay attention to your state. If you need additional information on your state rules, um, you can um, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to help you with that. So what should you do? What should employers do now? Well, the first thing that you need to do is review your job descriptions and make sure they're correct. Um, make sure that all positions that are designated as exempt meet the criteria that we've gone over today. First of all, from a, a wage standpoint, and then from a um, responsibility and duties standpoint. Then you need to correct the status of any jobs that violate the rules. And it may mean that you have to go back and pay someone overtime because they were misclassified. Ensure that your managers know the rules because if they're um, doing the hiring, um, and they don't have strict guidelines on pay rates or responsibilities and things of that nature. And they may let tell someone on coming in, yeah, we, you can be salaried, it's okay. Well, they can't make those commitments, so you let them know the rules. And make sure you review everything annually to ensure your compliance. Okay, that's all we have for today. I um, wonder if you have any questions. Um, here's one here. If the staff meets the salary threshold, then they can still be non-exempt because of duties. Yes, you can You can always pay somebody hourly. You're never going to get in trouble for that because if you're paying them to be hourly and you pay them for every hour they worked, the, the Department of Labor thinks that's wonderful. So even if you have people that could be salaried that meet that salary threshold, you can, they can still be non-exempt based on the duties that they're doing. Um, here's another question. Does the test apply to nonprofit companies? Yes, it does. It applies to all employers. Okay, any other questions? Then type those in your question box. Okay, well, um, if you have questions after this, you will get a copy of this recording. Um, along with a survey that we hope you will take and let us know how we're doing. Um, if you have questions after this or you need help deciding um, what is going on with your um, jobs, need help with job descriptions, anything like that, just know that we're here for you to help. Um, one thing I will tell you is that we have a new compliance package, package in HR services that we're going to be rolling out in April. Um, there's going to be a webinar coming up in, in about a week, and um, it's really streamlined things to make sure that, that companies can get uh, compliant on all of these types of things uh, for a really, really good price. So let me know if you have any questions today, and thank you very much for coming, and I hope you have a great afternoon.